Well, well, it is very, very lovely to be here and see a room full of people caring about this thing that we, I think everyone in this room would say, well, how could you not care about it? And yet, action is not taken and things don't happen. So this is very, very, very exciting. Um, can I welcome my panel to, to come and have a seat first of all? And... Um, uh, fortunately, you're, you're not going to hear very much from me. I'm um, in many ways restricted from giving my opinion and campaigning because of the BBC bias regulations, which I take very seriously and actually make my life very easy because my opinion on this issue is worth almost nothing. But what the BBC forces me to do is make an argument with evidence instead. And in this case, that is extremely easy. As we're going to hear, and as we've already heard, the evidence is overwhelming. I will say one thing which I've learned uh, working on Operation Ouch. In fact, I'll pose a question to the room. What proportion of a child's uh, body weight is their brain? Does anyone want to have a guess? What percentage of their weight is, the, is their brain? Just shout out. About 20? Any other? Yeah, about 15? Something like that. Around, depends on how young you are. By the time you get to my age, uh, my brain's about 2% of my weight. What proportion of a child's energy intake, say six to eight, what proportion of their energy intake is used by their brain? Have a guess. Yeah, it's about 40 to 50%. All right, well, everyone, probably everyone just watched Operation Out, so that's great. Um, well, anyway, when I heard that, it absolutely blew my mind. Um, it, it is vast, vast amounts of energy that children need to think and, and perform and live and grow their bodies and have the freedoms um, that, that many of us enjoy in adult life. So, massively important. I'm thrilled uh, to have such a panel of experts because the rest of it makes my life um, very, very easy. Uh, we've got Camilla Kingdon, uh, president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. We're going to talk to you about the evidence and the health benefits. Uh, we've got Nicholas Capstick, CEO of the White Horse Federation, 32 schools focusing on disadvantage um, and, and um, what your experience with education is and the benefits of this. Uh, Mark Davies, Global Director of ISS Food Services. Um, in terms of delivering um, school meals, how that works, what the problems are with compliance, these things, we're going to touch on that. And Adrian Khan non-executive director of Yo Valley Organic, what it means to be a business working within um, the universe of supplying food to uh, children at school. Camilla, uh, can I start with you? Um, you are kind of sitting at the top of a vast tree of healthcare professionals who encounter the effects of diet and nutrition um, and can see the potential benefits of free school meals. Can you talk us through at the moment what, what, the, what the state of things are in the country, what harms you're seeing in the medical profession? Thank you, yes. Um, well, the truth is that children don't arrive in your emergency department or in your outpatient clinic with a kind of label that says hungry or undernourished. Um, it's much subtler than that and much more insidious and therefore very easily can kind of sort of sail under the radar. Um, you know, the, the features of poor nutrition or hunger may be a child whose behavior has changed or a child whose concentration and, and, and therefore ability to attain adequate education has been noticed to change. Um, it might be a child who presents with fatigue, you know, sort of non-specific um, uh, symptoms. We also know that good nutrition is vital for your immune system. So it might be a child who's recurrently presenting to the GP with lots and lots of intercurrent infections. So it's very non-specific. And the, the, the problem with that is that nobody stops to think and ask the family about the, the, their access to food. And so actually, as a royal college... Um, having spoken to our health visiting colleagues, school nurses, my general practice colleagues, we were, we were in increasingly, through the pandemic and then earlier this year, increasingly noticing more and more um, of our colleagues telling us stories about children that they were seeing where they were getting to the crux of it and realizing that actually there was just simply not enough food or the food that the family were putting on the plate was kind of 
poor in a nutritional sense. And so what we've had to do as a Royal College is actually develop a whole toolkit for healthcare professionals that actually starts explicitly giving them the tools to start asking questions that we historically have never asked before. So when you take a medical history, um, you know, we have not been trained to say, excuse me, um, do you perhaps use a food bank? Or um, can you tell me a bit about your housing? You know, do you have a problem with damp in your housing? Those are not questions that in the fifth or sixth or whatever it is, richest country in the world, we are used to asking. I mean, I'm South African, and I was born and brought up to be curious about the food that families could. But that wasn't something that I've ever done as a pediatrician in this country. But in fact, what we're having to do is almost retrain our workforce to start asking those questions, because unless you ask those questions, you don't get to the crux of the problem. And um, we're very, very fortunate at the Royal College. We've got a fantastic children and young people's engagement group that we call RCPCH and us. And in preparing this toolkit, we went to them and we didn't tell them what our endeavor was. We said, tell us what makes you happy, healthy, and well. And actually, it it brings a lump to my throat because in 2022, children were talking about, amongst other things, having breakfast, um, being able to eat food at school. Um, there, were, there were awful feedback around ethnicity and all the other kind of health, um, sort of social determinants of health, which we won't go into today, but is part of this picture. Um, and that was what they told us. And um, so I think the honest truth is that the, for frontline health workers, this is now front and central of our work. We need to upskill ourselves that we can engage much more actively in it, because the more you ask, the more you realize what a problem it is. And that's, um, you're painting really at early on. Is that one working? Yeah. You're painting an extraordinary picture because I, I totally understand that. When I was trained as a doctor, these were not questions that I asked until I went to work overseas, and yet they are extremely relevant to life in the UK. So I, I, what's striking to me is you're here. You're not just retraining your clinicians to also think about public health and the social health of their patients, but also as an advocate, as a college, an incredibly powerful voice being here. And so that's something to really, really notice. This is not a particularly clinical issue. It's not, you know, we're not talking about people starving to death, but we are talking about massive particular health impacts that do end up in front of clinicians. So can you quickly paint us a picture then of the benefits of free school meals from your point of view as a doctor? So, um, we, um, we're really worried about obesity because it, but this is not just about a lack of food, it's a lack of quality food or nutritious food. And the, the figures that we're seeing, and this, this, this um, has been accelerated by the pandemic, the, the figures that we're seeing of children leaving primary school who are overweight or obese, one in three, um, this is a major public health issue. And so actually, as doctors, we have, you know, it's crucial that we're thinking, one of our, our great raison d'etre as um, pediatricians is thinking about the health of the nation and investing in childhood to reap the rewards in, in adulthood. Um, and so actually, nutrition very, very much works to that kind of health pro promotion aspect of our work. So obesity is a really key issue. And then I think one of the previous speakers mentioned mental health. And, you know, the, we know the pandemic's accelerated our problems with children and young people's mental health problems, issues around anxiety around food, anxiety about pe children worrying about their parents' worry about food. Um, these these are, are really important issues that actually if we don't tackle, we're just storing up a huge a tranche of health problems that we will um, see uh, come to a much sort of greater extent in adulthood. Fantastic. And just the, the, the words that kind of light up when you say them are, it's not just about food and calories, it's access to delicious, nutritious, high quality food. It's so important. And I think it can, it can easily be underemphasized. So it's brilliant that you're... Um, and that you're focusing on that because this is this is the language that we should all all be using. Um, Nicholas, can I can I turn to you? Your experience as an educator. What are your staff, your colleagues, seeing in the schools, and what is the picture for them? And how would free school meals impact their work? Okay, it's um, not dissimilar to what Camilla was saying. 
Can we talk about symptoms? Symptoms of children coming in who are tired, who are hungry, who fail to concentrate, mood changes. And these are all things that we're seeing in school. And it's about what school's about. Is school about containing children or is it about enabling children? And without proper nutrition, without children being able to concentrate, they're not going to do well in their studies. Without children being able to be social through food, they're not going to become good citizens. So all of those things combined mean that we're seeing a degradation, we're seeing a deterioration in the raw product, our beautiful children coming into school, whose needs now are surmounted not by their educational or the cognitive difficulties, but just by being human, human beings. So we're seeing ch children who come in and are so fatigued, they literally cannot work first thing in the morning. And they can't work first thing in the morning, and then teachers are going to food banks and bringing food into school and feeding their kids before they can work, because they know there's a direct correlation between feeling hungry and not doing an awful lot, because your mind is not focused on what you could be doing. It's desperately focus on what you would like to be doing, which is eating and feeling new, nourished. So we've got tired children, we've got children who lack concentration, we've got children who really are not performing very well, and that fatigue then comes into their physical education, it comes into their mental agility, a whole range of things. So what do we want school to be about? Do we want it to be about creating great social people? We're not getting that because of this lack of concentration and the social mobility but that endangers people's mental health. We're seeing more and more children being withdrawn. Withdrawn because you're not, they're not the same as their peers. They're not able to eat in a social environment at lunchtime because their lunchboxes fail to add up to what others have got. And they don't meet that, that pathetic threshold of 7,400 pounds, which means they get free school meals. So the inequity that sits upon a child who is either impoverished or underserved by society is absolutely enormous for those children. And it's, it's so interesting to me, you, you, you talk about the kind of the exhaustion and the underperformance, and there does sometimes seem to be a paradox between we're talking about a lack of food, but we also have an obesity crisis. How does providing fee for free food cut down obesity? How does it, um, you know, why are these kids short of energy? But we do know that obesity, although there is a problem of overweight, there is also a problem of stunting. So obesity in the UK is malnutrition. So although children may be carrying excess weight, they are shorter than their peers in other better nourished countries. So we do, do have a, a genuine problem of, of malnutrition and therefore underperformance. Can you just paint a picture? There, there are two things you said really interesting. One about the social aspect of eating, and I remember school meals as being quite joyful. It was a moment where you could chat and discuss and reflect on things and very important. Um, and the other thing is, is what, it, what it is like to be a teacher actually in a room with children in the class who can't perform because they haven't got enough food or they're anxious about the, the, their food shortage later in the day? Okay, let's, let's look at the social side. The social side, if you look at every society in the world, food is a predominant part of just being part of a community. And that sharing of food, that understanding that actually we're all equitable because we, we eat similar things, we, we, we enjoy similar tastes and so on, is not prevalent in our schools anymore because kids are hiding their lunch boxes. They're eating below the lid of a lunchbox so that nobody else can see what they're eating, sometimes turning their backs on friends, not talking. So that, those, those times when we could actually start to understand. Um, I, I'm actually, as well as the CEO, I'm the head of a, a, a multicultural school. 51 different languages, 49 different cultures in that school. That should be a United Nations melting pot of kids just sharing understanding, sharing community values, sharing their food even. And that does not happen. It, happen, it doesn't happen because p kids are afraid to actually be shown up because what's in their lunchbox probably isn't what they would want to be in there and isn't what they think should be in there. So the mental health difficulties that we're seeing as a result of the lack of food, the, the lack of self-esteem, and that then translates into what happens in the classroom. Because a child without self-esteem isn't going to perform well in the classroom. They're not going to do well in their studies because, you know what, they have little self-worth. And actually, if society has not provided for them, they start to get angry. So we're seeing angrier children in, in our classrooms. We're seeing more disenfranchised children. We're seeing more isolated children, and therefore more mental health problems. But what we're also seeing is a greater number of children who get labels. 
like Charles a AHD or whatever, because you know what, their behaviours are not necessarily what we'd want to see, but their behaviours are quite often through hunger, through disenfranchisement, through just literally feeling a bit frustrated about the world and the world in which they live because of food poverty. One in four kids last month lived in food insecurity. That's four million children in our country who go to school, have at least one day where they felt really insecure about how they're going to eat that night or where they're going to get their next meal from. And as you said, in a civilized society, that feels very uncivilized. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible to hear the two of you talk together and hear that cascade from um, the hospital, from clinical problems, into the origins of those problems, which begin with doing things that, that many people, that so many of us, and this is what James Bethel was saying, take for granted. Things like enjoying a decent meal at lunchtime with your friends give you the skills that will echo long, long, long into the future, into adult life. Um, Mark, can I, can I come to you? In, in terms of um, the, the practical business of delivering this, even though free school meals are available in parts of the UK for certain age groups, um, uh, uptake and compliance is not perfect. Paint us a picture of what it means. There are benefits for students, of course, teachers, for all of us more widely. There are also benefits for the catering industry. Just, just give us your perspective on what it means to do this and how it would work. Sure, thank you. What, what two very, very powerful speakers. Uh, uh, now, I'm here to champion the superpowers of those, those people, the industry, the school food sector, that plan and prepare and serve school food to the millions of children up and down the country every day. Um, I, I have a confession. I, I, I no longer actually directly provide school meals as part of ISS. I started a new challenge in well, my get career out, at then. the start That's of this it. year. Um, uh, but I had a 14-year, uh, what I describe as a love affair with school food. I started in 2007, um, and, and it's never left me, so I'm really delighted to be here and share my thoughts and what impact the, the, that this, this intervention would have. And I think I would start by saying that, that the school food sector um, is part of the broader hospitality industry. Um, you know, we've heard an awful lot through the pandemic and through the, the current uh, uh, crisis that we're, we're living through about the impact on, on, on the hospitality sector. And the school food sector, um, in economic terms, is probably sat right at the bottom of, the, of that sector. I mean, where, where else, out of home, can a child get a varied, two-course, fresh meal prepared by passionate, trained people every day for £2.50-ish? So, you know, this sector is super important and um, it's going through the same challenges, you know. So it's got uh, you know, inflation challenges, it's got cost of living, uh, it's got staffing challenges. And so this surgical policy intervention, as we heard it, would be a massive boost and it would be huge opportunity for what I call a creation of a, a virtuous cycle of improvement because that intervention would just be an enabler for service improvement within the school food service delivery. And that improvement, whether that's in quality of the food, whether that's in staffing, whether that's in you know, extra activities, curriculum, more equipment, um, would actually encourage more people to, to, to enjoy that, that service. And so when you, when you have a situation where the service improved and the children are happier and they enjoy it, then more children will be encouraged to eat that food and in, enjoy, enjoy uh, the health and, uh, and the benefits that they get. And of course, the greater the, the volume of school meals you're serving, the more you're supporting your supply chains. And we've got Adrian here today from Yeo Valley that would benefit from that. And then of course, the volume also creates better value for the customer because in, in, in our industry, it's a, it's a volume industry, so you're able to impact on the cost that schools pay for that meal, cost that parents pay for that meal, and therefore it's good value. So all of those interventions creates that generation of, of, of improvement, and indeed for the caterer, you know, some surpluses that they can then reinvest in even more improvement in service, and so therefore you get a virtuous cycle. So it would, it would be a huge boost to the sector to have this policy um, uh, introduced. 
I think all I would say, just finally, is it will take leadership and governance. It's not, it's not easy, but the industry is filled with dedicated and passionate uh, and purposeful people. So I'm pretty confident that they would, they would smash it if, if this got uh, into play. And can you, um, I don't know if you can speak for the sort of the, the, the on the ground experience of feeding children, but, but your staff who are doing this, um, I think lots of children have a, a good, with, we all have a good rapport with the people who feed us, the individuals. Do you hear from them about the frustrations of only being able to feed certain people? It, is that a thing that they would notice in the canteen? Oh, without doubt. I mean, the stories that I heard when, when I was uh, leading a, a school food business was immeasurable. I mean, and, and the people, particularly the cooks who, who lead the operations, are some of the best people in society because they care so passionately about providing school food to the children in their schools and are heartbroken where they can't do what they are you know, professionally trained and passionate about. So absolutely, yeah. And in terms, quickly, of the barriers to compliance, what are the what are the difficulties? Because it's there's still you know there's not there's not high compliance. It's certainly not 100% compliance yeah. um, even at the moment. What are the barriers, and how could we address that beyond just funding? Yeah. So so I mean, I was uh, involved in uh, universal free school meals, um, and so so I had an experience of having this boost, and 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 and, and the, the sector were given nine months to deliver it and it was a policy that was introduced which I think I think was quoted as one of the best policy implementations ever um, and and certainly had very little noise in uh, in the media and there were very few schools that couldn't deliver on the policy so it, it was implemented really successfully and therefore I have absolute faith and confidence that it would do the same with this intervention. Um, I think there was a missed opportunity um, in UIFSM to have better governance and data collection around the impact of the policy. So certainly with this, I would say that it would, it would, if it would be better um, and, and the broader impact would be, would be uh, felt more broadly if there was good governance around compliance, as you say, and around uh, measuring the impact of the, of the policy. And, and you know, there, there is already legislation in place for school food standards, so there's not new legislation that's needed. It will just need some, some good governance to make sure that the, the school food does um, Im improve when um, uh, this is introduced. Okay, so, so far we have the benefits to children, to the NHS, in terms of health, short-term and long-term, mental health, physical health, all aspects of this. We have um, the benefits to the teachers and to the schools, the learning environment for everyone, and the very, very long-term effects of that. We have the benefits to a hugely um, difficult industry at the moment that's had a really tough few years um, in terms of growth, opportunity, training, um, and uh, a kind of positive atmosphere of able to provide a more equitable um, service to the people they're looking after. Um, Adrian, can I finally come to you? Uh, at Yo Valley, you've been supplying food to schools for many years. Just start off by talking about what it means to be a company that does that. Well, well I guess um, Jamie started by um, doing good business is good. And, uh, you know, Yo's been supporting this case for many, many years. We've been working with the Jamie Oliver team probably over a decade, um, I and mean, we were working in the Food Foundation for um, pre-lockdown, pre supported them at our Valley Fest last year, um, and supported the Tom Kerridge campaign, um, which was led by Marcus Rashford. So, so this is close to our hearts. Um, what it means to us is by providing school meals, and clearly providing school meals, we can't just click a switch and say, put it into a thousand schools, because we have to go through tender process and win business. But knowing that some of our products land up on the uh, benches and desks of school children um, is nice to know that they're getting delicious, nutritious um, dairy products, which have been made in the United Kingdom and have um, come as a result of the hard-working efforts of British dairy farmers. So through the supply chain, um, we can hopefully ensure that in that there's employment and primary agriculture on the land through to manufacturing um, and if we're successful in securing contracts and getting our dairy products into schools, then the knowledge that we're doing good by getting good, healthy, nutritious products, hopefully on the spoons of our youngsters. 
So we have a, a kind of cascade of benefits there, where you're, you're going from a world where, it, potentially in a school, there, you, you have hungry children to children where the, lo the school meals that they're eating are also supporting their local account economy, parents of other children in the schools. That's the universe you're looking to build and benefiting local suppliers. Yeah, uh, the words local economy and local supply chain, we need to remember now that the UK is quite a small place and we have probably one of the most advanced supply chains in the world. And we've got four, four manufacturing units in Somerset that supply from Land's End to John O'Groats. So local to us, actually, whilst we're a local manufacturer and a regional brand, we're actually a national supplier. And whether our yogurts turn up in Tesco in Aberdeen or, or in a school in Scarborough, it's, to us, it's local. And our milk pool is, is local, actually. Um, but whether it's Joe Valley or whether it's any other dairy or yogurt supplier, uh, for, for us, part of the importance of this is, is that 800,000 more people in schools feeding off UK-produced or farmed, manufactured, grown product is good for local economy, it's good for employment, it's good to know and have the knowledge that actually even on a local level, there's hopefully people in local schools um, feeding products that are manufactured locally. So we've got a, a couple of minutes left of this session, and what I'm finding so kind of enjoyable about the atmosphere in this room is that we're not trying to persuade, I don't think really anyone in this room that this is a good idea, everyone's on board. What we're trying to do is help everyone win arguments, or not even arguments, but be persuasive in conversations that are going to go on in Westminster, around the country, potentially around the world, which is an incredibly positive and exciting thing to do. I often find that when I'm trying to persuade someone of something, my voice gets high-pitched and wobbly, and I start to forget what I was going to say, and then they win the argument, and I feel foolish and upset, and I can't quite access... I know I'm right, always, but I can't quite get it over the line. And so I just would love to go along the panel and sort of get from each of you that soundbite, that thing that from your position is most compelling so that when I'm next having or we're all next having a conversation about this, rather than going, well, I think this, I can go, look, the president of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health told me this thing. And if you can do each of that, if we can get sort of four points that will be real knockout blows from each of you, that would be a lovely way to end the session. Sorry to spring it on you, but I think everyone here has their elevator pitch prepared. So if you can give us, give us this. Camilla, I'm, I'm going to start with you because I think it's okay to pick on medical doctors. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's that, uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, as a paediatrician, really regret having to resort to the economic argument because actually as a doctor I want to be able to win the science argument I would hope as a pediatrician to win the hearts and minds of people so actually I always feel um, rather regretful when I have to resort to, econo to res an economic argument but I think you know Lord Bethel's point was very very well made um, and so as a pediatrician I would I want to say that there is evidence that if we were to feed these extra 800,000 children um, and made that investment, every pound we invested, we would return one pound 38, because someone's done some really fancy economic modeling, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to report that figure. But um, more importantly, we'd be investing in our future. And I think this, we, you know, the, the sort of tone and the morale of, of the UK is quite low at the moment. We, um, people are sort of struggling to see the kind of glimmers of hope. But as a paediatrician, I'm telling you that the, our children are our future. But, but we can't take them for granted. So we need to feed them, we need to nourish them, um, and we will have a more optimistic uh, future ahead of us. Growth, growth, growth sounds different from a paediatrician. It's like, that's, that's what we want to do. That's all, the, that's all the right things. That's lovely. Thank you. Dr. Nick. Okay, what I want to call upon is the notion of what schools are about. They're about creating the future wealth generators of our country. And in a time when we've got economic decline, when we've got economic pressures, why not invest in young people who are going to create the wealth, who are not going to be a burden on society because their health is not good, who are going to be very sociable, good Work, hard-working people. So that investment, apart from the 38% return on every pound that's ever spent 
creating 8.9 billion pounds. Don't let anybody tell you that we can't afford it. 8.9 billion pounds is what we'll get in benefit, but we'll also get a society that is worthy of being called a good and noble society, looking after each other, but basically looking after ourselves. So that's what I would look for. These are great arguments. Do you hate money? Do you hate children? This is yeah. great. <laughs> okay. Um, Mark. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I think I would just say that, you know, again, just looking at all of the evidence that you've seen and heard today and in the material that you've got in front of you from Feeding the Future, um, it is so compelling. Everybody says this is a good idea. Everybody, you know, and, and I remember universal in free school meal, that policy wasn't universally accepted as a great idea, but this one is. So the argument is FOMO, isn't it? Why would you I not love, when love it's that. so I'm going to try that in every argument, though. I'm just going to go, everyone agrees with me. <laughs> um, Adrian, can I, can I end with you? Yeah, and for me, it comes down to the economic case, um, fully and wholeheartedly about the economic case of producing food locally. United Kingdom putting fresh food through uh, through our supply chain and not having over processed food is important to that and therefore putting fresh wholesome nutritious foods uh, on school tables will help with communities um, will help with local employment local jobs and producing good products on our land which I think rounding up as the economic case for it Lord Bethel is agreeing with him. Perfect. What a wonderful panel. Thank you all so much. <laughs>